Well, good morning. Welcome to Vashon Island Community Church uh, live uh, on Facebook. You'll notice uh, we're at the building right now. Uh, we decided to change a couple of things up uh, from last week. On March 25th, our Governor Jay Inslee said that uh, worshiping communities like churches and synagogues could stream live services with, with small teams from their, from their building, from their place of worship. Uh, so for a few logistical reasons, we're deciding to give this a try this morning. Uh, just a couple of us are here uh, streaming the service. Uh, my wife, Nicole, and I, who live together. Uh, Nathan, our worship leader, and I, who already work together every week volunteering at the food bank. Uh, Pastor Tyler has agreed to come in and sort of run behind the scenes for us. And so uh, just if you're watching this and you're kind of a little bit confused why we're not quarantined at home anymore... Uh, part of me is a little sad that we've lost our solidarity with you, not uh, streaming from our homes. You're stuck at home. I kind of liked being stuck at home, too. But we have a few logistical reasons we're trying to see if maybe streaming uh, worship from the building works a little bit better. So, uh, yeah, so welcome to Vashon Island Community Church. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll welcome the Lord's presence this morning. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful to be able to uh, worship you. Uh, we are so grateful to be able to gather, even if that is virtually, we are able to gather uh, together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are able to uh, worship you, worship him. Lord, we are able to worship in your spirit as we unite in prayer. And God, we just invite your presence in each one of our homes. We invite your presence here in this building. And we just ask that you would just manifest yourself to us. Speak to us in the worship. Hear our prayers. Speak to us through your word. God bless every gathering of, of uh, believers on this island, uh, every gathering that names the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for our friends and for our neighbors who don't know you, that they would begin to think about and desire a connection with the one who made them. And God, we just pray that today as we just enjoy the sun, as we uh, just continue to process and protect ourselves and make wise choices during this pandemic time, we just turn our hearts to you and just ask that you would be our protector and our comfort, Lord. Uh, so we bless you and we invite you here this morning. Amen. Let's worship the Lord and we're going to welcome up the worship team now. Good morning. This, uh, this comes from Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. <laughs> Oh 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That even in these, these trying, dark times, you're with us, God. We know that you never leave us or forsake us. We thank you so much for your presence, for your glorious presence that's with us, uh, for the joy that we can have even in the midst of trials. And um, we just pray a blessing uh, this morning, Lord, over everyone watching, Lord, um, everyone in this church, everyone on this island, Lord, that, that you would be very present here on this island um, amidst your people, um, and that you would uh, show us how to love our neighbors well and how to go out and extend the gospel to people um, in this time and help us to, to be ready to be in season. Lord, if this was ever a season, this is a season um, to be ready to, to share your good news with people and share the hope that we have with people. Uh, we thank you so much. Nathan forgot to move his Bible, so I had to disinfect it. Uh, good morning. Welcome to uh, Vashon Island Community Church Online. You might notice that a small number of us are, are gathered uh, here at the building. Uh, in case you missed uh, my introduction uh, this morning, uh, we discussed this week uh, uh, a decree, I guess you could call it, that our governor, uh, Jay Inslee, made on March 25th saying that small teams of people could gather at the church to stream the service. So we're giving it a try to see if it just solves some of our logistical issues of streaming a service. Uh, but us doing this doesn't mean that we are wanting to communicate anything to you as a congregation other than continue to be careful, continue to love your neighbor as yourself, continue to stay home, uh, continue to uh, do everything that we need to do to protect our community, to protect our neighbors, protect the vulnerable among us. Uh, everyone here on this team already has some sort of physical overlap. Uh, Nathan and I from volunteering at the uh, food bank, uh, Nicole and I from living together. Uh, Pastor Tyler has agreed to come and, and run behind the scenes and he's uh, being careful as well. Uh, as Christians, we don't live in fear, but we do, we do live wisely, amen? We do live wisely, and we do love our neighbors as ourselves. And, uh, and uh, as many a theologian has pointed out, uh, the command, thou shalt not kill, means also to be careful and to uh, treat life as precious. So we treat our neighbors' lives as precious. But uh, hopefully streaming the service from the building this morning does simplify a few things and make things a little bit easier. Amen? Well, at this point in the service, uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Uh, we're just going to take a few moments. Uh, I'm going to remain silent so you guys can pray at home, voice whatever prayers are on your hearts. We'll do that for about a minute and then I'll pray. And then uh, so we can do something in unison despite our separation, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Amen? So let's pray. Living God, we do thank you that when we come before you in prayer, you do promise to listen to us. God, that we don't come before you by our own righteousness or goodness. We don't come before you on our own merit. But in your mercy, we're able to come before you because of your son, Jesus Christ, who lived sinlessly, before you on our behalf, who died a sinner's death in our place, and who rose again and is seated at your right hand, interceding for us and pouring out your spirit into us. And so God, with the confidence knowing that you hear us when we pray, Lord, we just want to pray right now uh, for our friends and our neighbors, Lord, we pray uh, for those who 
are isolated and lonely. We pray for those who are afraid. We pray for those in unsafe home situations. We pray for those struggling financially. We pray for those in the uh, service industry who are working and working hard and, and putting uh, themselves in harm's way so we can have food and we can have the, even the comforts we're used to. Lord, we pray for medical professionals, for your protection of them, your encouragement for them. Lord, we pray for New York and all the other places around our country and around the world where the suffering is intense. God, we pray mercy. God, for ourselves, we pray your continued protection. Lord, we pray your continued protection of Vashon. Your continued protection of us and our homes. God, we pray for our state. We pray for our leaders, local and state and national and even international organizations, Lord. We just pray for our leaders that you would give them wisdom and, and strength and peace. God, we pray you would call many sons and daughters to yourself during this time in faith. As Nathan has already prayed, Lord, we just ask that you would give us the courage to bear witness to the hope that is within us. God, glorify yourself. Be a healer and a deliverer, Lord. We ask that you would flatten the curve and bring, bring resolution and healing, Lord. Bless the scientists as they work on vaccines and they work on treatments. Lord, bless the doctors and the nurses. And Lord, bless us. Give us the peace that passes understanding in this time. And God, that we might act in unison before you, that we might pray together before you right now. We pray that prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome uh, to Vashon Island Community Church. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, normally at this point in the service, we would just go through just a few basic announcements. And I just wanted to let you guys know about a couple of things. One, if you are a, a regular Vashon Island Community Church attender or member and you're on our email list, um, we're going to have our, tomorrow night would be when our monthly prayer gathering is scheduled, so we're going to do that. And since the stay-at-home order is going to go for about a month, I'm going to, as far as I know, not being one who knows the future, I'm going to uh, predict that I think probably every Monday for the next uh, month or so, we'll just gather on Mondays to pray. But definitely this coming Monday, 7 p.m., it'll be a Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, the link will be sent out through the VIC email list. So if, you don't, if we don't have your email address and you want to participate in that, uh, what you'll want to do is uh, go to vashonchurch.com, fill out the Contact Us page, make sure we've got a good email for you, and in the comments ask, please add my email address to the list and tell us who you are and stuff like that, and we can uh, make sure that you're getting uh, the prayer meeting invitations. Uh, also, this coming Friday, today is Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday for some uh, we didn't have palm fronds, but, you know, as charismatics, right, we can wave our palms before Jesus, right? Uh, there you go. Um, this t uh, today begins Holy Week, and so uh, this coming Friday, Good Friday, the day that the church is set aside to meditate upon the death of Christ specifically, uh, Vashon Community Church and Bethel Church are going to be doing a combined service, as we've done for the last couple of years. Um, it, it will not be a service you physically attend. It will be through Facebook Live from the Bethel Church page. So be sure to find that and like and follow it if you haven't already. And uh, Pastor Luke and Nathan and myself, who again already have physical overlap because of some work we're doing at the, at the food bank, 
Um, so we're not introducing new uh, physical cross-contamination, if you will. We're going to stream from the Bethel building and have a Good Friday service. So, so be sure to plan for that 7 p.m. this coming Friday. Uh, and uh, two more things. Also, as a church, generally, uh, during this time, if we were physically gathering, we would encourage people to fill out a connection card and pass it in. If you do have prayer needs, again, vashonchurch.com, contact us. You can go to that. You can let us know your prayer needs. Uh, I'll be praying for you this week. Uh, just let us let me know how I can be praying for you, and I, and I will gladly do so. And lastly, uh, we definitely want to keep um, uh, supporting uh, the church and supporting what God's doing. If you do want to give of your tithes and offerings to uh, just continue keeping things going here at the church during this time, uh, again, bashonchurch.com. The giving link takes you to a secure app called Tithely. And you can, you can get, do your online giving right there. Uh, otherwise, you can mail in checks, P.O. Box 2479. Uh, but yeah, so online or through the mail, be sure to continue uh, giving just to support the ministry. Obviously, if you are one of our digital guests, we're not making any expectation that you give. We welcome you here. But if you do consider uh, Vashon Community Church your, uh, your community, your church home, your church family, uh, just, uh, uh, just continue to, to do your part and worship God. Uh, by participating in uh, our financial needs. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, this morning, uh, as we begin uh, Holy Week, we're going to find Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to read a fairly long portion of text this morning, but especially uh, during Holy Week, a lot of, traditionally in worship, a lot of reading of Scripture is just part of it. So, so usually in our more contemporary worship, the sermon's the big thing, and the reading of Scripture, we kind of tune out so we can get to the sermon. Can't do that this morning. It's a long passage, and I think we really need to meditate on God's Word as a group. So I'm going to read Matthew. It's the first book of your New Testament, chapter 27. Uh, that's the large numbers that mark roughly every page or so of text. I'm going to read verses 11 to 54, and the verse numbers are the, are the numbers marking uh, uh, roughly every sentence or so. So you can get out a Bible app or a physical Bible or just listen along, and we'll spend some time in God's Word this morning. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who's called the Messiah? For he knew that it was out, out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. When Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers' governors took Jesus into the praetorium. That's, yeah, took them into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and then they knelt in front of him and mocked him, 
Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked Jesus, they took the robe off of him and put his own clothes back on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe in him then. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him, for he said, I'm the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Let's pray. Living God, God, as we just meditate on the immense tragedy and injustice of the death of your Son, let us also meditate on the fact that it's a, a death he endured for our sake. That in the death and resurrection of Jesus, darkness and light went to war. And that in the apparent victory of darkness, the light won. So God, we ask that you would speak to us through your scriptures today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, as I've already said, begins Holy Week. Traditionally, we call today Palm Sunday. But many churches have two services on this day. One early in the morning is called the Liturgy of the Palms. It's a celebration and remembrance of Jesus' triumphant, triumphal entrance into Jerusalem a week before his crucifixion. It's the Palm Sunday celebration. The second service is called the Liturgy of the Passion. And it anticipates Good Friday, the day the church remembers Jesus' death on the cross. 
Sometimes today is actually called Passion Sunday instead of Palm Sunday, especially among churches that don't plan to gather for Good Friday. This morning, though we do plan to gather virtually on Good Friday, I want us to meditate on the Passio, which is Latin for the suffering of Christ. Let's dwell together on the death of Jesus this morning. Last week, we finished our series in Galatians by thinking about the Christian's relationship with the world. We saw that for a Christian to be crucified to the world doesn't mean to be an enemy of our neighbors. It's not to be an escapist from our social responsibilities either. It is to be crucified to what is sinful in this world. And it is to be willing to lose anything and everything in our discipleship to Jesus. Jesus is the king who lost everything for us. And to be his people is to be willing to lose everything for him. This morning's text is a reminder how upside down Christianity looks to the world. And how upside down the world looks to us when we're viewing reality through the lens of the gospel. There is, laid before all people, two irreconcilable paths. The path of Jesus and the path of the world. And Jesus' crucifixion is the epicenter of this contrast. The first thing we see in our story is the confrontation of power. And you have the representative of the power of the Roman Empire, Pontius Pilate. And the representative of God and his kingdom, Jesus Christ. Sometimes as Christians here in America, we can really struggle with the apparent impotence of our Christian faith in society. It can be hard to convince people of the truth of the gospel. If you don't know that, you've never tried. More often than we like to admit, the things we pray for don't happen. Or they at least don't happen the way we've been asking for them to happen. The church, especially in our part of the country, is small. We have a few big churches and we like to go there and gather there to feel safe and to feel like we're part of something big. But the actual percentage of people who love and worship Jesus in our region is quite small. The world threatens us. And we would like to threaten the world back. That's why we get so wrapped up in politics. And in a condescending sort of apologetics that basically says that those who don't accept the Christian faith are weak or stupid or more evil than ourselves. We want to set ourselves back in the power position somehow. But when we look at Jesus as he stands before Pontius Pilate and before his accusers among the religious leaders of his day, we don't see Jesus grasping at power. The author of the book of Hebrews says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. In the Gospel of John, we see Jesus saying that he only does the will of his Father in heaven. We see a Jesus who is totally committed to the way of the cross, to giving up his life as a ransom for many. Jesus knew that the way set before him of weakness, of looking like a fool, of depending on the will of the Father, even in his moment of being abandoned by the Father, was the only way he could go. Jesus accepted weakness in the face of human strength, in the face of the greatest political and military might in the known world of his time. Jesus stood silent. Years later, the Apostle Paul would write that as a missionary and church planter, he had learned the key. When I'm weak, then is when I'm strong. And God's power is made perfect through weakness. As followers of Jesus, we don't grovel. We don't make a show of our shortcomings in some kind of reverse psychology. But we do give ourselves up to the will of our Father. We accept that we look weak and foolish to the world. 
We love others and sacrifice ourselves on their behalf. And we do this as followers of the one who took our weakness on himself at the cross, who atoned for our sin, and who won eternal life for everyone who believes. The next thing we see is how upside down the world's justice can be, especially through the lens of the gospel. The crucifixion of Jesus was the greatest act of evil that has ever happened. We are rightly offended and angry when we see the unjust suffering of children. We hate the way we see children sacrificed on the altars of vanity and comfort. But the death of Jesus was a greater act of injustice than the death of a child. Jesus was a grown man, and he knew what he was doing. And so in many ways, his death doesn't grab us the way the death of a child does. But Jesus was innocent. He wasn't naive or inexperienced like a child, but the Bible tells us that Jesus had never done anything wrong. He challenged his accusers to point out his sin, and they couldn't do it, though they would have loved to. His innocence wasn't the lack of opportunity. His innocence was a life of unbroken love and devotion to God and people. It was a positive good. It was a positive innocence. He lived a life without sin and was murdered as a criminal. He lived a life of unbroken devotion to God and was executed a blasphemer. And Pilate allowed all this to happen for the sake of expedience. It was the easiest thing to do. The crowds demanded it because their leaders whom they trusted said it was right. The religious leaders themselves demanded it because Jesus posed a threat to their power and challenged the way they understood God. I lay my life down willingly, Jesus said. No one takes it from me. But his death was the greatest act of human injustice in the history of our world. Which brings us to my next point. The death of Jesus is also a judgment on all our apparent human goodness, on all our spirituality, and on all our religion, our Christian religion included. For all our talk as human beings about the natural love, about our natural love for God, and the innate goodness of the human creature, the fact remains that when God showed up among us, we killed him. And his murder was led by pastors like me, the chief priests and the elders of the people. It would be like me announcing on a Sunday morning that the deacons and I had met with God, didn't like what, we had, had, what he had to say, so we took him out back and shot him. And it would be like you guys saying, well, Pastor Mike and the deacons probably know best. I'm sure they prayed about it. And I'll admit, I have a hard time with how negative an estimate the Bible gives of our human tendency toward religion. There are people in other faiths I really like. And it's not just that the Bible has a negative judgment about those people. Our holy book is unique among the scriptures of the world in how negatively it portrays its own people. Israel in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New are constantly failing. There really are no heroes in the Bible. One of the biggest evidences I believe there is for the reliability of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is how poorly they portray the twelve disciples. If our New Testament accounts of Jesus were nothing but later myth-making based on the religious claims of some dubious apostles, why are the official stories about their experiences of Jesus so full of examples of them missing the point? Why is Peter constantly getting corrected and even rebuked by Jesus? And let's not forget that the priests and religious teachers who led the way in the murder of Jesus were in their day the official representatives of God's people. It's true that Jesus began a new people called the church by means of his 12 apostles plus Paul, but the Bible nowhere gives us a, posti- a positive estimate of the natural religiosity and inherent spirituality of the human race. We need to be redeemed, not given a trophy. 
And that goes for Christians as much as for anybody. And lastly, faith. Our story this morning flips our notions of faith on their head. Faith is a virtue, we like to tell ourselves, right? It's a possession of the virtuous. We win the prize and we pull down treasures from heaven with our faith. Or, faith is the blind leap of hope, an act of existential bravery. One person has even described faith as believing things you know can't be true. For some of us, faith is the act of the brave and the noble. For others, it's an act of the foolish and the helpless. But the only faith we see in our text today comes from the mouth of an executioner. As the crowds disperse, perhaps having gotten bored with the spectacle of suffering or having become frightened at the earthquake which has just now happened, the only people to left to stand at the cross is a centurion and his soldiers, the very people who have just killed Jesus. And what was missed by the religious teachers and by the church-going crowds, well, temple-going crowds, but you know what I mean, what was missed by them was seen by a pagan soldier who kills people for a living. Surely this man was the Son of God. Far from being a virtuous act, faith is more like a thing that happens to us. One theologian has called faith the sense of being grasped. Something, someone, other than me, has taken a hold of me. And I can't get away from them. I may not even want that person around at first, but he's there. He is God, and he is the God revealed in Jesus. That's why, if you know your Bible, whoever those 24 elders are in John's vision of heaven in the book of Revelation, that's why when they gather around God, they take their crowns, which would be a sign of a, a reward given to victors, and they throw them back at God's feet and say, Worthy are you, God, and by extension, not us. He, God, has saved them. And he has saved us who believe in Jesus. And he can save you if you turn to Jesus even now. The story of the cross is, if anything, a story of how we simply cannot save ourselves. God flipped the world upside down. And he let himself be murdered, all with the purpose of forgiving his murderers. As selfish and sinful people, you and I are among his killers. If Christ came to die for sin and we're sinners, then we're part of his, the cause of his death. And God doesn't say that's okay exactly, but strangely he does seem to say he's not surprised. And when we realize that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, reconciling us to himself, and when we realize that we've spent all our lives being our own gods instead of submitting to the one God, we find ourselves strangely grasped by a power that's not ours. We're grasped by God, and we're called to faith. We're called to repentance and to new life. We're called to die so others can live. We're called to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we are grateful for what this week means as we enter into Holy Week, the week that pulls us towards the memorial of Christ's death and pulls us beyond that to a celebration of his resurrection, and by extension, ours in him. So Lord, bless us as we worship you from our homes. Bless us as we, some of us go out to work, some of us work from home, and some of us just sit at home trying not to go mad. May you fill us with your presence this week. And in whatever little way your wise spirit leads us, may we be salt and light. 
and lay down ourselves for the sake of others, just as you've done for us. We bless you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. And have the musicians come back up.
this morning. And that's right, I need to move away so Mike can come back up. <laughs> that's what he was saying. Right. That's, that's what that means. <laughs> Just kidding. Amen. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for uh, worshiping with us, sticking it all the way through. Uh, really looking forward to um, seeing you guys virtually, if uh, no other way, this week. I'll hopefully see some of you in prayer tomorrow night, uh, see some of you uh, as we worship this week, uh, and as we gather on Good Friday together with the congregation at Bethel, and as we gather and we're going to try to come up with some special things so Easter can still be, Resurrection Sunday can still be a special time for us as a community. So God bless you guys. Let's close in prayer and I'll let you go. Uh, living God, we just bless you. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, we are able to um, worship you as a community. Lord, we just ask you to empower us by your spirit. Send us forth as salt and light. Even if you simply send us forth uh, to our own homes, households, and our neighbors, if there is some way we can help them. Lord, bless us now and empower us with the spirit of Jesus, that we would be a crucified people who follow a crucified Lord. And we bless you in his name. Amen. God bless you guys. Share the love of Jesus with each other. And we will see you hopefully a lot this week.